Uh, my name's Ann Tunerman, founder of Tales of the Cocktail. This is actually our sixth Tales on Tour. So we've spent two years in Vancouver, two years in Buenos Aires. This is our second year in Mexico City. And uh, if you join us in New Orleans in July, you'll find out where we're going uh, the next two years. Uh, this is actually our first said talk on the road. So we're really excited to have some of the best people in the business talk to you about what makes the world's best bar. I'm going to introduce Philip Duff in a minute, our director of education, and he will guide the presentation. Uh, in the meantime, I want to thank our sponsors because without them, there would be no Tales of the Cocktail. And you're drinking out of a lovely Absolute Elix pineapple uh, from Pernod Ricard, Mexico. So I know that drink's got to taste as good as it looks. So uh, I, th I think I'll get one when I'm done. Uh, but now I'd like to welcome Philip Duff to the stage, director of education, Tales of the Cocktail. Oh, and two more things. I'm sorry. I forgot to mention one, uh, and he's going to mention this too. The hashtag for this event is TOTCMX. So if you want to use it, and also, if friends or colleagues did not purchase a package in advance, we are selling tickets to seminars at the door, so meaning literally at the door. So tell them to come up. Again, there's usually somebody that does not show up, and we can sell them a ticket at the door. So uh, if they did not purchase in advance, that is an option if they want to see something. So thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Now would be a really good time if I knew the Spanish for please don't steal the pineapple to say that to you, but I think you get the message. Welcome to Said Talks, our community's version of TED Talks, 15 or 16 minutes of awesomeness. Pernod Ricard have graciously sponsored this. Can we get the uh, screen up, chaps, by the way? Yeah, of course, you can totally fuck around with the computer. Um, we've always wanted to share the distilled insights of the people who make magic happen all around the world. So we created a special World's Best Bars edition of said talks for today. This isn't associated with the Drinks International World's Best Bars, although every single person speaking today runs one or more of the world's best bars, but they're generally acclaimed by almost everybody who hands out awards that these are some of the world's best bars. I gave each speaker a very clear brief, which was just come on and talk about opening, running, taking over, managing, going out and speaking about one of the world's best bars, the inherent challenges of doing this, the rewards. We've got speakers today from London, New York, Athens. So everyone has something to share, which is relevant, whether you come from Mexico or Brazil or Colombia or whatever. So I'm really just spinning it out here while this guy and the guys at the back like wave at each other because something has clearly gone badly wrong, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, oh no, oh really, excellent. Still, I had time to fit in a quick, uh, a quick drink. My password, by the way, is password, just in case anybody wants to read that. Look at that. Uh, what do we do? Duplicate, extend? Yeah. What do you think? Where, where do you want? Let's go for uh, extend. Boom. That means I can see it too. Brilliant. Uh. So, first up, very big hashtag TOTCMX, hashtag said talks. And Hilton have very graciously given us an almost impenetrable password for the Wi Fi. <laughs> Cocktail. And our first speaker is a friend of mine who has had an extremely varied career. He was a chef, a mixologist himself, a trainer. He is the owner of the multiple award winning Worship Street Whistling Shop and the brand new Black Rock Bars in London. He is the principal of Fluid Movement Consulting. Ladies and gentlemen, our first set talk speaker today, Mr. Tristan Stevenson. Welcome, 
No. Right, that's not going to work, I don't think. Let's just keep it simple. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Philip, and thank you very much, everyone, for, for coming here today. Uh, this is really exciting, my first time in Mexico City. I've only got 15 minutes, so I'm going to keep the, uh, the, the preamble that short. Um, how to open and maintain one of the world's top bars. I'm going to do this in 10 steps, and actually, when I was devising this presentation, it struck me that each of these steps are not just relevant to the bar industry, but also to any kind of business, really. Um, and that is the principal message I want to put across. If you're opening a bar, whether it's the world's top bar, or, or indeed any bar, you're getting into business. And that starts with the dream. You have to dream big. In some respects, other factors such as time and money actually are insignificant compared to the size and the scope of the dream. Um, I would advise never to, to sacrifice any part of your dream unless you absolutely have to. Every one of the bars that I've opened, I've opened four cocktail bars and two restaurants in the last six years. Every one of them has started with a dream. And the process of turning that dream into a bar has been a, about fashioning that dream into something that works, something that's feasible in terms of money and feasible in terms of practicality and, and time and staff and all of these things. Every one of these bars was exciting in its own way because I got to see the physical manifestation of that dream from start to finish. And it's quite an incredible thing when you, you lie on your bed at night or you wake up in the morning with this concept of, of something that could be special in your head and then you have the opportunity to see that get built around you um, and often by you. Sorry. The, the next part, uh, part two is, and this is an important one, open your bar. Don't open anyone else's. And what I mean by that is don't turn down money given to you by someone else to open your bar. That's fine. If someone's willing to give you money, take it. But what I mean is open your bar. Don't attempt to copy someone else. Don't attempt to ride on the back of a trend. The, only one of the venues that I've opened was a failure, there were, and we actually had to close it down. And that venue was a speakeasy cocktail bar uh, with a hidden entrance through a hot dog restaurant. Sound familiar? It was an awesome bar, but it wasn't my bar. It was a concept that we'd seen and that was obviously very successful, and by the way, I'm talking about PDT in New York, of course, that we thought we could do just as well in London. And um, it, it was a great bar. I really enjoyed spending time there, but it didn't work for various different reasons, not just because we copied it from someone else. There were other factors involved too. But I do believe that it was an element. It had a part to play in that um, because it wasn't our own. By Imitating instead of innovating, you're, the only person you're really fooling is yourself, and that is the truth. Um, we're missing the heading on this one, uh, but the heading should be, don't kid yourself. Okay, be very aware of what it is you're getting yourself into when you open your own bar. You start out as the guy on the left, a hipster bartender with a mustache and a bow tie and a set of braces. And then you end up like the guy on the right, um, a tie instead of a bow tie, <laughs> the braces still, no mustache. The point is you become a businessman. As soon as you pick up that set of keys, as soon as you sign the lease that gives you 10 years of this venue that you need to slog your heart out in order to make it work. Other people will rely on you for their income. You'll have employees. They'll need to be able to pay their rent, feed their families. You take on a great burden of responsibility when you become a business owner, and it's not all fun and games. Do it yourself. And this is a really important one. It's one that I believe in uh, enormously. This picture here uh, is of me and my business partner, Tom. Uh, it was taken about five weeks ago, uh, because we just opened a new bar, Black Rock, about four weeks ago. And uh, it is us uh, getting ready to decorate the place. This is our sixth venue, okay? We've made some money along the way, but we've not forgotten what was important to begin with. And at 
That is that fashioning of that dream, that seeing it come to life with your paintbrush, with your plumbing skills that you've had to develop over the years, because if you're opening a bar, you need to know a bit about plumbing, believe me, especially waste pipes. <laughs> it's all the mint that gets down there. Uh, it was drilled into me in my early years when I was young uh, by my mother. She used to always say to me and my brothers, if you want something doing, do it yourself. And that was, of course, because we weren't doing what we were told to do. But when you hear that every single day, it does start to leave a lasting effect on you. Um, and that saying actually originally apparently comes from Napoleon. Um, if Napoleon said it, it's probably true. And I really take that mentality on board. I trained as a plumber when I was younger. I also trained as an electrician. One time I used to build computers. I also used to build websites. Um, I trained myself to be a graphic designer. So when we opened our first bar, it was me that was tiling the floor of the bathroom until midnight. It was me that was designing the menus from scratch. It was me that was designing the website as well. And I take pride in that. And it's one of the best things about being a business owner and, and opening a great bar is that you can make the decision as to whether you delegate these tasks or not. Uh, okay, we've been missing a few slides here. So I'm going to just ad lib. That quote's good, though. Um, the second the sort of caveat to doing it yourself is don't do it yourself, not all the time. <laughs> it's great to surround yourself with people that know what they're doing. And delegation really does become the key, especially when you become a multiple outlet operator. You have to know when to kind of throw the towel in and say, you know what, I don't really have time to be mopping floors here. I need to be doing other stuff to grow the business, to ensure the development of my staff, to ensure that my guests are getting the best possible experience. So it becomes a case of managing your time and deciding upon when it's right to say, you know what, we need to employ a full-time accountant. The people that, that run my business for me, there's about 40 of them, uh, they range from PR consultants to graphic designers and illustrators that we've employed to create artwork for us. We do have a full-time accountant uh, who manages all of our finance and, and spends a lot of time looking at the numbers. Uh, we have uh, a part-time uh, social media strategist, who's actually my wife, <laughs> uh, and so on and so forth. Knowing when it's the right time to delegate is absolutely key, otherwise you will burn yourself out. Focus on the plan. Um, from acquiring keys to opening the doors of Black Rock, the most recent bar that I just opened, it took only three weeks and one day, which is the fastest turnaround we've ever had for a bar or restaurant. Now, this was a full refurb. We were decorating everything. We put a new ceiling in. We laid a new floor. We routed all the plumbing because we have fresh tap water, filtered tap water on every single table. It's a whiskey bar, by the way. Um, we had to build cabinets. We installed a three and a half foot oak tree trunk into the bar. We had to organize the back of house, train staff, develop a food offering, develop a full drinks list. We had to buy, program tills, till system, back of house system. We had to install a music system. We had to install CCTV. Because it's the sixth time I've done it, I've become a lot better at it. And I couldn't have dreamed of being able to turn something around that fast the first time I did it. So what I'm saying is that if you're opening a bar for the first time, you might not have a choice. It's something that you need to learn. But sticking to the plan, prioritizing, mapping everything out and scheduling it all, and scheduling the people that are required to make that happen is critical. Because it's a cliche, but time is money. And if you're paying rent on a place, you want to get that place open and trading as soon as you can. Oh, these are the people that, by the way, who uh, help my business. So I went through them already, but you've got accountant, PR consultant, wife, Laura, who is also social media lady, my electrician, this is the team at Whistling Shop, or some of them, my illustrator down the bottom right, who is not actually an illustration, he's a real person, but he illustrated himself. <laughs> Again, we're missing the heading here, but, uh, and this is a bit, of a bit of a dark one, but be careful who you trust, okay? This is somewhere that I've personally been burnt, so I, I would really recommend you think about who you get into business with. 
And this is a tough conversation to have, especially if it's with an old friend or someone you've been working with for years in a bar, and you decide that the two of you or three of you or five of you would like to, to go it alone and set something up. It's difficult to question those relationships because they're, they're based on friendship. But you will be creating a new relationship as soon as you go into business together, and that is one of business. And things don't always work out how you planned them to. Uh, I started opening bars with two, two other business partners, and along the way, uh, the relationships became strained, and we had to go our separate ways. It was the best thing that had happened since we went into business together. Um, but I could have avoided that heartache if I'd really thought about what I was doing. But of course, it's the excitement of opening a bar, opening a restaurant, and it's easy to get carried away with that. And you should let that carry you. You should let it drive you. But make sure you, question the important, make sure you do question the important things. Read the small print. Uh, opening a bar is exciting. But uh, don't let that dream eclipse the reality of the seriousness of the situation you're getting yourself into. You'll be signing legal documents. You'll probably be borrowing money from someone or other. You'll be employing people on contracts that you're obliged to pay. And all of those things are quite scary. It's easy to just kind of go, it will be OK. This place is going to be a success. None of that stuff matters. But it will matter. It will come up and bite you if you're not careful. And small print is so boring. So if, you, if you're that bored by it, pay a good solicitor to read that for you and then distill that information down into a package that you can digest and then react upon afterwards. It seems like an obvious one. Be passionate. I'm, I'm, about, I'm passionate about innovation. I'm passionate about getting things done. I'm passionate about doing new things. But it's easy to lose that passion along the way as the reality of business and of running a bar sets in. So keep your mind active. Keep on learning. Keep on reading, keep on going to seminars at Tales of the Cocktail, keep on engaging with your peers within the industry, keep learning from one another. Write books, that's what I ended up doing in my free time, for what it is. And that's a channel for my passion, it's something that I can do outside of the bars, but it's still relevant, still, still part of the industry that I'm involved in. Uh, the final slide, again, this one's missing its title, but... Um, I mean, really, it's just about relaxing, taking it easy, remembering who you are, why you did this in the first place. Don't kill yourself trying to run a top-class bar, trying to achieve this and achieve that. Eat well. Exercise. Do all the things that keep you healthy and happy. Keep a happy state of mind, and then the rest really does follow. Thank you. Wise words from someone who's done it. If you ever get a chance to go to London, uh, Tristan's told me you can all have free drinks at both his bars. You just show your tales of the cocktail, Mexico Pass. It's totally okay. They are remarkable places. They really are. Next up is somebody, when I was putting together this little slide, I realized she has worked in probably more award-winning bars uh, than anyone I know and I live in New York City. Julian Vos is the bar manager of a bar you might not have heard of called the Dead Rabbit. Yeah, I know. Uh, and before that, she was in charge at Death & Co. She's also worked at Maison Premier and Clover Club. She has a unique perspective on what it is to work in and run one of those bars that constantly wins awards and gets nominated and indeed is asked to come and speak and talk all around the world and especially at the Dead Rabbit itself which continues to go from strength to strength which makes a fabulous amount of money and makes a fabulous amount of people very happy and satisfied on a daily basis. There are probably people there having fun right now. So without further ado, our next TED Talk speaker from New York, Gillian Vos. Thank you, Phil. 
and Tristan, great job. You actually took a lot of my points, so uh, I'm messing. Um, so yes, um, I'm Jillian Vos. I am the bar manager at the uh, Dead Rabbit Grocery and Grog in New York City. And today, I'm going to be talking about kind of my role. Um, I'm not a bar owner, but I am a bar manager, uh, and what that kind of entails. And again, we only have 15 minutes, so let's see. So this is the bar. Um, this is uh, downtown Manhattan, and as Philip said, uh, there are definitely people having uh, some, some pints right now as we speak and some Irish coffees. Um, so my role uh, as a bar manager is, is to oversee mostly the creative part of, part of the job, and what that means is I oversee all the drink development, um, I help out with the menu design. Uh, if some of you have seen some of our crazy menus, um, that's definitely a part of my role, working with the owners and our design team. Uh, again, it's not a, a one-man show in any way, shape, or form. It's absolutely a team effort. And um, that delegation pro process of you know, having, having a strong team behind you and um, ha working with my owners is uh, definitely probably one of the biggest parts, uh, most important things that I would say Um, and these, this is them. Uh, Jack was supposed to be here today, and unfortunately, he was not well. But uh, uh, working with these two men here uh, has been definitely a highlight of my career. Um, they're very hands-on. Having an owner that having owners that are very involved, that they're there on a daily basis. Um, basically, my job is to take their vision and, with alongside my vision, um, work together to create something special, unique. Um, and we use this word a lot, relevance. Um, what keeps our bar relevant? What keeps, it, um, what keeps it going? What keeps us special? What keeps us unique and different from, from the rest? And that's really, uh, it's, a, it's something that we have to think about on a daily basis. Um, our menus have to be different. Our drinks have to be spot on. They have to be spectacular. Um, our service standards are above par for what we think. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that go into that. Um, it's a lot of little details that all to come together to create one big, um, amazing bar. So things that kind of go into that are little things like, you know, timing our drink tickets. Uh, might seem very tedious, but uh, every single drink order that goes out um, behind the bar is on a timer, and then at the end of the night we have our um, our slowest time, our fastest time, and then we do an average. Um, and that, it's not to be for punishment, it's not if you get a long ticket time that you're reprimanded, but it is so that we can kind of keep track of, you know, if somebody's waiting more than 10 minutes for a drink, that's un unacceptable in our eyes. And so that would be, okay, you know, we'll give you a little bit more punch or maybe a little champagne just to kind of ease the pain. There is, there is such a thing as a New York minute uh, in New York, and people do feel that. So what feels like five minutes to, uh, what, what is five minutes uh, is actually m more like 10 or, or 12 minutes to a guest. And so we, we have to keep all those things in mind. I'm just showing you the bar as we go along so you have something to look at. Uh, this is the tap room. Um, but, but little things like that, um, understanding and being very empathetic to our guests is something that we take extremely seriously. And uh, that's something that we incorporate into our service standards as far as um, verbiage when, from our doorman when they walk in the door. It's the first and last person that you see. Um, the way that they're greeted by our maitre d', that we stagger the people that come in uh, to the bar um, in, the par in the parlor so that, you know, everything feels like you're getting things um, very fast. And, and you actually are, but uh, it's definitely making sure that um, everybody is seated and greeted and gets their drinks and their food and everything in a very timely um, and, you know, considerate manner. So I'll tell you a little bit about the bar. This is, um, this is the tap room here. Um, this is kind of the, this is the pub. And this is where the standing room, it's, uh, it's packed on a daily basis. This is where you'll find Phil Duff uh, a couple times a week and maybe Dale uh, having some Irish coffee and maybe a pint of Guinness, a little whiskey, uh, and the uh, very large Irish whiskey collection. Uh, this is the parlor. This is where you'll find uh, myself behind the bar and this is, uh, what I was talking about, about the staggered seating, uh, the seating only, um, and all that. Um, and then this is the 
occasional room. So this is where uh, we also have kind of uh, more, more table seating, but more of a casual setting similar to the tap room. And um, because of this um, dynamic with the three floors, we're really able to cater to um, quite a large variety of, of, of demographic as far as um, people that want to sit down and not be bothered in the parlor, people that want to just have have some booze and, and hang out and get loud and, and a little crazy. Then you have the other two floors. It also serves as a waiting room. Um, so Jack and Sean definitely came, uh, came up with a really good business plan to really keep people in the building no matter what they're doing. Um, if they're waiting for the parlor, if they're not. Um, we have a wide variety of regulars um, that are uh, coming from all over the world, also neighborhood um, industry on a regular basis. And um, as far as the concept itself um, coming about, uh, it, was, it was very smart. I'm actually, I'm actually kind of pissed I didn't think about myself, but it's, uh, uh, it's somewhere where they they're catering to, to all sorts of different kinds of people um, on a regular basis. And our, our regulars and our, our longstanding our guests that come in from all over the world all the time are um, proof of that. So another thing that we do um, at the Dead Rabbit that we take very seriously is our education. Um, and this is something that keeps our, keeping a happy staff is extremely important, um, a healthy staff and keeping them engaged and involved is extremely important. Um, if, if I just went and did all the cocktail menus myself and told them, here's the specs and here you go, that's when you're gonna get people that are not feeling that they're part of a team. And we do things very democratically at the Dead Rabbit as far as cocktails where um, everybody, is, um, everybody has to submit cocktails uh, for the menus uh, every quarter. And we do a series of uh, research and development for that, where we all get together, we taste each other's drinks, we give each other feedback. Uh, of course, you know, this is overseen by Jack and myself, but it's something that, that keeps us all together and everybody's excited. There was a menu that I had uh, done recently um, that we didn't have, a lot of people were traveling, we didn't have, uh, not everybody had enough drinks on the menu and I could sense that um, lack of enthusiasm. And so it really, really is important that uh, everybody has a, has a role and everybody has a part in, in the menu de development process because you can really tell when someone's excited about selling a drink to or pitching a drink to, to somebody that, that, that you can see the excitement on their face. And that's a really big part of, of running a team is, is making sure that everybody is a part of it, um, that you're not being a dictator or being, you know, this is the way it's done because I said so. That's never, never, never a way that you want to run a team. Um, and I've definitely, I mean, I don't, I don't find that I've been a dictator, but I've definitely seen or in some instances made, might have found myself uh, in certain situations like that. And I, I, it does not work at all. So um, being, being a, a team leader means, um, you know, being with your team, not, not, above your team. And like I said, the efficiency with the timers, um, another thing that we, we really strive on is the efficiency behind the bar. And that means a really, really, really um, tight mise en place. And this is, this is our, the station behind the bar on the point. Um, as you can see, we have a lot of cheater bottles. Um, it's a pretty crazy station. We have three, three types of ice, um, about 200 cheater bottles on the, on the, uh, on the bar. But it's all kind of in a, uh, there is a method to the madness in that we know which, which row uh, has what and everything's in alphabetical order depending on the, uh, the style of either spirit, fortified wine, uh, all that kind of stuff. So we also have an iPad, if you can see that kind of glow on the right hand side. Um, that is so that you're never turning your back to a guest. Um, if you forget what bitters is in, in something uh, or, you know, need to look up a classic recipe or, you know, a previous menu item, uh, the iPad is right in your station and you can look that up and it's all on a searchable database. And that's something that um, I implemented right when I came on board. I looked at this Rolodex of about 300 recipes and I said, oh my lord, I am not going to do that. So we, we, we came up with this, this concept and it's worked really, really well. And I would, wouldn't probably open a bar without it. It's uh, extremely helpful. So. 
Um, another thing that we do is um, menu development. It's not just the, the, co the cocktails, it's actually the stories that we tell within the menus. Um, it's also working with our design team in Belfast, Drinksology, and Mark Rehill, our, our uh, artist who does all the, the graphics. So um, this does not happen overnight. This is about an eight month process. And uh, this, com this involves everybody, all the management and designers coming together and coming up with an idea, then a story, and then fine tuning that as we go. Actually, some of Sean's emails uh, to the artists have actually are, are framed on the wall because they're so outrageous. I never thought I'd be uh, seeing an email like, uh, you know, well, I think that, you know, well, I, I won't even get into that. Never mind. <laughs> Let's see, Sean. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I hope you guys come to our seminar on Monday as well. And uh, thanks for having me. Take care. So another fantastic presentation by somebody who daily looks after thousands of people and has come in and taken over one of the world's most prestigious bar programs. Now. Uh, our next speaker, you may know that Greece has had its fair share of problems in the last few years. A major economic crisis being at the center of uh, the refugee crisis in Europe. But while all that has been happening quite under the radar, there has been a steady growth in really incredible cocktail bars throughout Greece and especially in Athens. And some of the best known operators, uh, internationally known, are Nikos and his uh, colleague, Mr. Karitsis, and their business partners who opened a brilliant bar that in a very short time has gained world fame and listing on all those lists of world's best bars, the Clumsies from Athens. So, whoops. Uh, fortunately, we don't have to worry too much about uh, all the photos, Nikos, but please give a warm welcome from Greece. Oh, screw this. Yeah. <laughs> or we could just get Karina to come up. No, 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 no. <laughs> Nikos Bagulis. <laughs> Chili had the car. Hello, everyone. Opa. Um, first of all, we really want to thank you to invite us here and uh, set talks. I'm Nikos Bakoulis uh, from the Clumsies in Athens, and I'm really honored also to have Michel Dale here. Uh, so, um, the basic uh, thing, then you have an idea, um, and the idea looks to move uh, to the dream, and uh, after that, uh, the dream comes true. Um, this is something like magic, you know? And for us, uh, the clumsy start an, as an idea. And uh, now we try every day to follow our dreams. And uh, with uh, our partners, we, have, we keep in mind all the time um, how to create uh, our dreams stronger and stronger. Um, so the clumsy is opened uh, at uh, December of uh, 2014. And... Uh, for us, the big challenge for us is uh, opening in a very, very difficult period. Uh, in the last summer, we leave uh, uh, all those problems about the economic crisis. And uh, this is the first challenge for the Greek customers. The second uh, biggest challenge is um, in the center of Athens, uh, in a historic place, we have more than 300 bars. It's not all in, only uh, about cocktail bars. I mean, uh, wine bars, bars, just very simple uh, place. It's easy to thinking. Then you don't have much money to choose the right uh, place. Need to be really, really unique and need to present something new. Um, but all the time, need to keep in mind uh, to respect our customers and our our uh, main vibe about the drinks and about the people. Um, we, we designed the place that looks like very, very old uh, house, like a hundred years. 
but then you ring the bell in the, in the house, need to see a very, very uh, host, ho uh, hostable and very, very familiar uh, face. So, um, how to adapt this uh, in a Greek people with international standard? The first of all, need to be unique, okay? I see around the world many uh, bars that inspire for other countries. In Greece, it's very difficult to present something, for example, um, speakeasy, because the people need to see the sun, need to see the people that uh, um, really have uh, uh, really uh, loud people inside the bar, really dance vibe, and uh, at the same time, uh, need to feel more comfortable with the, all the, let's say, details about the professional bartenders. Uh, so create a place that uh, separate in the three basic uh, uh, parts. The first part is the main uh, bar, which is open 10 in the morning till 2 in the night, um, except some busy uh, days till 4 in the night. And uh, we serve coffee, food, that designed of, uh, by Michel and Star Chef. And uh, we serve also two different types of coffee, but all the focus is about the drinks. Uh, because as a Greek uh, people, we don't have culture uh, like an uh, American guy or a um, UK guy. Uh, uh, we don't have culture about the drink. We have culture about the drinking, you know. And uh, for the last 20 years, uh, we start to, to make some drinks or, or some cocktails. Uh, the high-end things is uh, the last five, six years. Uh, then uh, many bartenders of, of the Greece uh, take the reason to open the bar. And uh, this industry goes every year really, really fast up. But uh, goes uh, really, really fast, not because we don't have culture about the drink, because we have culture about the flavor. We're living in the Mediterranean line, and for that reason, we, have, we understand perfect whatever um, we have in our palate. Um, okay. So... For that reason, in Greece, uh, the Greek palate is quite sweet, and for the drink, it's like young, let's say. Uh, it's unusual to drink uh, uh, too many dry martinis or too bitter drinks. For that reason, the, the main style of the drink is quite sweet, or the key point is to put a little bit sugar level in, into the drinks. This is the first step, then you really want to present something new. And uh, I mean new, the conceptual, conceptual menus. Uh, now we launch uh, the new menu we call uh, Special uh, Relativity, inspired for the Einstein theory. And uh, then uh, um, I see the people to, to check the menu. Looks like really, really curious about the ingredients, about how to thinking. But the people trust our uh, bartenders and our job uh, because we don't put all the you know, uh, information and details and uh, cultures really, really fast. We try to, uh, uh, to um, let's say, uh, trust each other. Uh, so, to be unique, it's a key point for us because uh, then you have a bar that looks really, really uh, British or really a New York style. And the uh, people outside of the Greece, like international people, come to our country, need to see something unique. If you, uh, the people from uh, London, need to uh, see one more bar, that the bar looks like London bar, which is the unique part of our job? The unique part of our job is to present all the time our character, our culture, and our uh, self. So the main bar and the main floor uh, it's all day bar, as uh, I said, and we have two more um, part. Um, we have one more part we call the room, uh, which is not speakeasy, but it's more, let's say, uh, comfort privacy about uh, the fine drinking. Uh, we serve only premium drinks uh, upstairs, and um, we don't have wine or beer, and we, we we try to create an environment that uh, the people feel more like a living room, you know, like home, uh, with a personal bartender and maximum 10 people. But uh, then you have uh, 
a lot of ideas about the drinks and uh, how to serve cocktails in a high volume bar that uh, the clumsies maybe the busy night at the same time serve up to 300 and maybe 400 customers. It's quite big. And uh, someone told me how to create uh, 700 drinks, uh, cocktails per night with the same consistency. Uh, the heart is the very, very uh, important for the body. Um, in the clumsies, the heart is the lab. The lab is not uh, for the show -off for us. It's a special equipment in a total that uh, help our bartenders and uh, our minds to create uh, first all the innovation things and second to keep the consistency because have the own space that create all the time uh, the ingredients. And uh, what else? What else? And uh, yes, okay. So, and then you have two or three very special equipment. This is one of the first, first and very young mistake that happen when you uh, make drinks. That you have something complex around you, and your mind complex, uh, thinking two times or three times complex. Then you have, for example, a rot of or something like that. Thinking all the time the complex way. But uh, uh, the ingredients and the drinks is more easy. That you take out all this complexity, you can make uh, um, the easy way for the bartenders, the easy way for the drinks, the easy way for the ingredients, and you take the better result. Okay. So. so, that's all. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, that was excellent. Our next speaker uh, probably needs little introduction at Tales of the Cocktail Mexico. Karina Soto Velasquez, a native Colombian, has founded some of Paris's best known and best loved bars and a restaurant. She's well known for her ambassadorship for agave spirits and Great bars all together. Can you not hear me? Am I too loud? Oh, she gone to the toilet or something? Excellent. Excellent. Well, I could always start off doing the presentation myself. I mean, it's, it's going to be a bit of a shock because she was going to do it in Spanish. So we left a nice bit of room for her uh, to do it. Well, this is nice. Excellent. One slot of 15 minutes. Leo here, Leo. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I did open a bar in Amsterdam. It's funny you mentioned that, Dale. Hang on a sec. I'll need a drink before I talk about that. It is a strange thing. We live in a world where we are so connected now by events like Tales of the Cocktail, by social media, that your bar can become famous so quickly. And without going into too much detail about Tales of the Cocktail or Door 74, my bar in Amsterdam, originally number 24 on the list, by the way, right? just so you know. Uh, I was sitting once next to the commercial director for Drinks International, and Drinks International puts together the world's 50 best bar list, which is just one of the lists. And Somebody at that moment texted me from Copenhagen and said, yeah, I just opened a bar. How can I get on the list? And I'm like, well, Roger's right here. <laughs> so I said, Roger, how do you actually get on the list? Is there, uh, do you fill in a form or something? He says, if I knew that, I would open a bar. He said, you've just got to get yourself out there. You've got to visit travel network and things like Tales. You've got to do guest bartenders and Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and write books and all that jazz. You've got to publish elaborate cocktail menus. There's no one thing that you do. But being out and being part of the community, uh, something that Tales of the Cocktail is very dedicated to, is one way to connect with each other, not just in this room or in this part of the world, but all around the world. So uh, 
thanks to Dale for the segue, because otherwise I was going to tell disgusting jokes. Um, but you'll be delighted to know that Karina has returned from the restroom. Uh, Karina, welcome. You all ready to go? You, can, you want to put on the mobile one? Yeah, put it on. Mobile mic, and you're all set. Ooh. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Good afternoon. My apologies for being late. My presentation. I'm a partner with other two people. They live in Paris. I'm sorry, I can't hear her. Uh, yes, there we are. I live in Paris for 12 years. I'm from Colombia. My father is Chilean, my mother Colombian. I grew up in Colombia. My two partners are American. They are bartenders, cooks, and we met at work in Paris. Three migrants decided to open Candelaria. Candelaria opened in 2011, and since we opened our doors, we have received many awards. Our work has been simple but very human and with a lot of passion. All the points Tristan mentioned in the beginning, I hope you wrote them down because that's exactly what you need to open your business. So what do we do? Tacos. We opened a taco place, 12 square meters, with a Mexican chef who participated in the investment in our business. And now the chef we have is Carlos, he is Colombian, he lived in Mexico for many years. Luis Rendon, the chef that associated with us, opened a tortilla store in Paris because there are many Mexican restaurants there and good uh, traditional food and not Tex-Mex. So we're probably representing the Mexican culture with traditional recipes, with fresh produce, we respect the cycles of French gastronomy, that is the environment. We do not use products that are not seasonal in winter. We use potatoes, apple pear, and we import chilies, dried chilies, and we use traditional recipes adapted to the season. Uh, the taco shop is too small. Uh, the recipes are also traditional. We prepare barbacoa, carnitas, suadero, but we, well, the meats change over time. It's not always the same. The taco shop was very successful. It's small, as you can see, but it was always crowded. And that's one of the best places to drink mezcal. There we go, the bar. The bar is uh, in the back of the taqueria. It has beautiful details. When we thought what we were going to do, it's 40 square meters. It's quite small. We have only 20 uh, seats. The decoration is not Chesterfield or great sofas or beautiful tables. It's good in furniture, first, because we didn't have money, and secondly, because we thought it was nice. But it's very cozy. It's clear. It has perfect illumination. People look pretty, and they seem to be having a great time. The menus are hand-painted by an Argentinian artist who lives in Berlin. All the artistic collaborations are very important for us. We want to give uh, opportunity to young people as us who have not been able to show their talent so they can do it through us and our places. And Ivan. At the top, he's our bar manager. He's also a migrant. He studied psychology, children's psychology, and now he's a bar, bar manager. He joined us four years ago. He was bartender, and now he's in charge of the operation. 
So the bar has many details you can find in other great bars worldwide because we want people to have an experience and live something special. But most importantly for us is that people should have fun. We prepare a, a huge uh, volume of cocktails. We have a bar bag, two bar bags and two bartenders. And in, on a Friday night, they prepare. They, we have four people. The bar is small, but people are standing up, having fun. Why? Because it's Paris. In Paris, the best way to communicate and get to know other people is at bars and be and standing up. The culture of having a cafe standing up and meet the other person is very French. And that was very important for us, having a bar where people only sat and they can't communicate with each other or be warm. That didn't match our style. So the people in Calendelaria have a good time. The cocktail is very important. The quality of the cocktail is quite important as well. And I'm going to, well, th this is uh, Ivan's work. And they are the creatives. They prepare beautiful stuff. When we opened, when I was behind the bar, I, I'm a bartender. I come from the New York bar. I worked three years in the first New York bar in Paris, which was the Experimental Cocktail Club. I was a manager there, and I learned the recipes from Julie Rayner and others, and all those American mentors that taught me what I know what to do. What, what, what to do now, but I do not do the fatouage or infusions or that sort of things. I leave that to the guys in charge of the team because they want to increase the, the level of the bar and show the world what they are able to do with the art. So this is Candelaria. Glass. This is our second project that opened in September 2012. It's number 97 of the uh, world's 50 uh, top 100 bars, sorry. And this is a project which is the simplest because it's only a bar. It's a bar with one floor that has illumination, is dark, people have fun, they have a good time. Cocktails are delicious but very classic. Four or five ingredients, tops, so that they are prepared fastly. And it is an experience not only for the cocktail, but for other things. The neighborhood where it is is Tigal, which is a sector where for many years has been the, the red zone. The, While well, the Moulin Rouge is there, but also on the street, the, the, there were brothels. So when we found this place, we brought it to a 65-year-old woman that wanted to retire, and it was a brothel. And we changed the decoration, and we were the first one in that street. Nowadays, after four years of opening glass, there are four cocktail bars, two hotels, and three restaurants. That didn't ex exist four years ago, so we're very proud of the impact of glass in that sector. In glass, they drink a beer, we dance, we have loud music. It's open till 5 a.m. every day. February 2013, we opened Le Marie Celeste, which is a concept that my partner Joshua had been working on for many years because he's a sommelier, he loves wine. Carlos is an excellent bartender. He's married to an Italian. He's passionate about amaros and vermouth, a bitters and vermouth. And we associated with him, we partnered with him. It was our fr the first time we partnered with a bartender. And we opened the Mar Celeste. The cuisine is small uh, dishes to share. The chef is from Copenhagen. The sous chef is Italian, so we are at Babel Tower. The place is open. It works better in summertime because of the windows. As Nico said, in Europe, in summertime, every, everybody wants sun. So it's the our the only place that works well in summer. The specialty in cocktails, what we call low ABB, ap aperitifs. We uh, prepare cocktails with wine, with bitters, and we use flavors that are coherent with the cuisine. So this menu changes with the same dynamic as the dishes. 
So here's the picture of Le Marie Celeste. When it opened in 2013, it uh, received an award by Fooding Magazine. It's like the French Time Out. And we were very proud to realize that the cuisine we had there had a recognition. In fact, Marie Celeste has more uh, gastronomic awards compared to our bar, but cocktails are delicious. But last year it was uh, ranked 100 in the 100 best bars. So our group that has four businesses has three bars in the top uh, 100 bars in the world. Hero opened in April 2015. Last year we opened this bar that also received a, a fooding award, this French magazine, as best street food bar. So what's Hero? Hero is Korean uh, <laughs> fried chicken. That's the traditional specialty. And then the inspiration of the food is not a, a, co a traditional Korean. So there's a, a lot of fusion. We had cocktails with typical Korean alcohols, like the seju, makyole, a lot. And they use many uh, bean f ferments, uh, rice, fermentations, so a quite interesting culture. And the chef Borman is excellent, and he prepares delicious food, and it's quite new for parties. These are Asian flavors, which is different to what you can have in Paris. In, in Paris, there's a great Chinese Sichuan food. This is Hero. Now I'm going to talk about exotic projects. None of these projects were thought to become the best bars of the world to receive many nominations or receive a lot of awards. No. In fact, we started with that, with the same issues as any other bar owner, with little money. And it was very difficult to start, especially with Candelaria. And we've, ha we've been very lucky with its recognition. I know it deserves it because we work hard, we're passionate, but it's not easy at all. And my advice, we opened these businesses for the neighborhoods, for the city where we live, and our customers. If you achieve that, the rest will arrive by itself. If your customers and the people who live there like what you do, that's everything, you earn international recognition. But the most important part is to pay the rent, your employees, and your debts. And then if you are doing something creative and incredible, uh, recognitions will arrive later. My advice for those who want to open the best bar in Mexico, for instance, is do not compare your bar to the bar next door. Do not compare your bar to the corner bar or the one in Condesa or Roma neighborhood, but compare your bar to Candelaria, compare your bar to the Clumsies, compare your bar to international bars. If you can't travel because it costs money, etc., read. Visit the internet, call friends. If someone's going to Athens, visit the campus. What are they doing? Take pictures because the inspiration is important. And if they have the recognitions, recognition they have nowadays because they deserve it and they work hard and there's something to learn about it. What Tristan says, yes, do not mimic because that's sad. We are all different and have different personalities. Uh, give it your own touch. None of our concepts, we didn't reinvent the wheel. None of the concepts are revolutionary, but they are well made and they are concepts with a directive line. And in Candelaria, we, we do not create gene specialties now and then. And it has its own personality and people go there because they have a constant and good product. And that's very important. Our mission, now we have 53 employees for businesses. We pay a lot of taxes, and we realized that our company needed a mission and a, a, and a guideline for the people who worked with us. That's very important. When you have someone 
Well, if I'm here today, it's because I know that Sebastian is in Paris, and he's taking charge of Candelaria. I know that I have an office that is paying the bills, and my employees have their salary, their social security, and everything's organized. And the only reason I can be here is because I have this. Build a creative community based on a culture of collaboration and openness. So what does this mean? Build a community where people may understand where you are going, what you want. You should be creative. I can teach you how to work with jigger, how to use a shaker, how to dilute a cocktail, what a Manhattan is, an old-fashioned. But I can teach you how to be honest, loyal, or to have a good sense of humor. I can't because I'm not your mother. I'm not going to educate you. But if you have this personality, a jigger, a Manhattan, and old-fashioned is quite easy. So build a creative community is key for us. Have people with personality, creative people, that they see the world differently. That's why immigrants are so important for us in Paris. We work with many French people. Everyone should be bilingual, French. People should speak English and Hispanic or from other countries should speak French. And we have two teachers at their disposal, one for English, another for French classes. And that's promoting culture. And also collaboration and openness. We are there for them always. If they have questions on why a cocktail costs 12 euros and they want to know how much money the company earns, we are completely open and honest. They should understand that when three glasses are broken, they are charged because we work with very small margins and the costs in each country vary. But in France, where I live, the cost of staff is ridiculous. It's very, very high. And we practically work to pay those taxes. So the margin is quite delicate. And people should understand why this effort and this work. So that's part of being honest and open. Our vision. This is practically the reason why we wake up every day at the group. The 53 people who work with us today are creative, and they want to offer unforgettable moments. Through our passion for gastronomy, because when we say unforgettable times, especially if you uh, spill a glass of wine over a white curd, uh, the customer will never forget it, but it is it's a negative uh, memory. So the idea is this, that the whole team will know what we expect from them when they show up for work. And this is the, the phrase they read every day. I am here today, and I will provide unforgettable, nice memories. I will work the best of me. And this is key for our company. Service, as Gillian says, is extremely important in bars because this is how it makes that today in craft cocktail, we make the difference, we set the difference. People go to a bar and will pay 10, 11, 12 euros a cocktail, not only for the experience of a nice drink, but also for the service. So we must promote good service, promote our waiters, our barmen, uh, provide them with recognition and make them look important. They deserve so. Also the dishwasher kit, because at a restaurant, when the dishwasher uh, is absent, everyone uh, pitches in. So it doesn't matter who misses the day of the job, but the dishwasher is important, and they deserve this recognition. And in your teams, if you are a chef, a barman, if you have a project, you should recognize the everyone so you will grow. This is key for a good entrepreneur. So this is all my presentation. Thank you. And finally, closing down the show, no stranger to anybody in Mexico, uh, Leo Robichek is the beverage director of Made Nice, which is 11 Madison Park, the Nomad Hotel, the Nomad Bar. He is also one of the uh, executive high command of the Cocktail Apprentice Program, making it possible for all of us to get as many excellent drinks as we do at all the tales of the cocktail. 
Um, I really don't think there are many bars in the world better than the Nomad Bar and the Nomad Hotel and the insane volume that they do there and the quality that they deliver is mind-boggling. So I try not to think about it. I just go there and drink. So without further ado, Senor Leo Robicek. Hola. Oh. Wow. ¿Cómo están? ¿Todo bien? Bueno, me llamo Leo, me llamo Leo Rubicek y soy director de bares de, uh, del Nomad, el Nomad Bar y la Madison Park. Uh, para confundir a todo el mundo, voy a hablar la primera porción en español y la segunda en inglés. No, no, no de broma, de verdad voy a hablar en inglés en un momentico, pero es porque nací en Venezuela y me mudé a los Estados Unidos cuando tenía cinco años. Y no sé por qué, pero mis padres nunca me enseñaron el vocabulario de coctelería. Um, bueno, la porción en inglés ahora, entonces si necesitan, se pueden poner los, uh, los audífonos. You can take it off now, Phil. Now for the English portion of the evening. Um, well, I only have 15 minutes, but for me it's more of a suggestion than a, than, than a time frame. Phil doesn't like that now. Um, Honestly, I just want to say thank you to all of you for waking up so early after uh, these amazing nights out that we've had, but for waking up and joining us here. Um, I also want to thank Tales of the Cocktail and uh, the Apprentice team for giving us some booze in the morning. Thank you. They've been working hard since 8 a.m. Um, Hello, hello. Um, wow. Mejor. Um, and then I also wanted to thank Phil for uh, inviting me to be on this panel. Um, I'm really humbled. Uh, all of the bars that went before me are some of my favorite bars in the world. Um, and honestly, pretty much everyone said everything that I was about to say, so why even have a presentation? So instead, I urge all of you to reach down and pick up your little bottle of Chivas 12, open it, Dale, that's you too. And drink it. Because I promise you that the more you drink, the more uh, funny and articulate I get. Um, all right, I guess I'll talk about the Nomad. Um, but honestly, I want this to be more of a conversation. I know that's not what Phil wants. Shot. Otro. Dale. Um, so if at any point you have a question, a comment, or an observation, feel free to speak out and say whatever you want to say. Um, for those of you that don't know me, again, I'm Leo. I run, um, como? Sorry. I also have EDD, so I hear voices coming from that side, and I just turn around. Um, but no, but for those of you that don't know me, I, I run a bar in uh, New York City called The Nomad, and another one soon in L.A. in 2017. We'll have another Nomad over there, so for any of you guys that go to L.A. in 2017, come visit us. Um, but in the next few minutes, I'm just going to talk a little bit about The Nomad, um, and then I'm just going to rant about other shit because nobody really cares. All right. Well, it's not switching, but... Oh, perfect. So what is a Nomad? Um... So this is all the stuff that you can find online. Um, basically, we have three stars by the New York Times. Um, so we are a restaurant, a bar, a hotel, a pub, a lounge. Um, and we are lucky enough to receive three stars for the New York Times in June 2012. Um, we also have one Michelin star. Um, we were voted, when we opened in May 2012, we opened in March, one of America's greatest bars by Esquire, Thank you, David Wondrich. Um, I obviously did not update this, but we were number 14 best bar in two, uh, 2014 in the, the 50. In 2015, we were number 24 in 36. So we opened another bar called Nomad Bar afterwards. So Elephant Bar at the Nomad Bar uh, is number 24, and, Elephant, and uh, the Nomad Bar is number 20, uh, 36. Um, we were voted best hotel bar of 2013 by Tales of the Cocktail. Thank you, Tales. Uh, and 2014, Best Restaurant Bar. Uh, we also won an Outstanding Bar Program in 2014 for the James Beard Awards. 
um, which for us is a, a really big deal in America. Uh, and lastly, um, we were number 67 in San Pellegrino's uh, 100 Best Restaurants in the World, um, but let's see what happens this year. So this is honestly all the stuff you could see online. It's really boring, and I just don't want to talk about that stuff. So I'll tell you more about the inside of what we do. And I'm going to apologize because the PowerPoint did not translate well from, uh, from the Mac to the PC. Um, so there's things just randomly in the middle. So Nomad, uh, we have 137 bar shifts a week. We do about $25,000 a day in cocktail sales, and that's about an average. We serve about 1,600 cocktails a day. We do 40 gallons of juice, or uh, 160 liters, roughly, of juice every day. We go through about four to five kilos of mint every day. We cut hundreds of twists and wedges every day. Um, we have 65 specialty cocktails between all of our menus that change four times a year for each season. Um, we have 32 cocktails that are in both bars, but then the Nomad bar has five cocktail explosions uh, and six reserve cocktails. In an elephant bar, we have 10 different classics, and then we have an additional 20 cocktails at brunch. Again, this is all just random shit. It doesn't matter. But I'm just giving you uh, a background of who we are and what we do. Um, but when Phil asked me to speak about the Nomad, I was like, well, what really makes the Nomad the Nomad? And again, I only have 15 minutes slash an hour and a half. Um, so I decided I'm going to talk to you guys about what is most important to us. Um, and there's tons of things that I could have talked about. But what I want to talk about is the importance of collaboration. So um, a quick Google search uh, in the dictionary will tell you collaboration is the action of working with someone to produce or create something. And then awkwardly, a traitorous cooperation with an enemy. Both of those seem pretty true in the bar world, but uh, that's what uh, you know, the dictionary says. Um, and then just a few quick quotes I'll put up there, but they're um, a little bit about collaboration that sort of means something to me. So when thinking about collaboration, obviously the first place that we went is the kitchen. And I'll give you a, a brief story of why. So when we opened Nomad, we had 11 Madison Park. And uh, 11 Madison Park is a restaurant. It's three Michelin stars. Um, it's a great restaurant, one of my favorite restaurants, but we were never really the cool kids. And when we opened the Nomad Bar, we made a big mistake, and we never thought we were going to be as busy as we were. So during Friends and Family, which is pre-opening, um, we got destroyed. And uh, executing the cocktail list of 65 cocktails for a restaurant that seats 110, a library that seats 45, standing room for another 100, um, was a little difficult because in New York City, people don't give a shit. And they, well, they give a lot of shits, but they don't give a shit. Um, they want their cocktails now. And for us, if you're sitting in the dining room, there's no way that a cocktail can come out over seven minutes. Because if you're sitting down and you order an appetizer, you're going to want that cocktail before your appetizer. And to be honest, we completely failed during Friends and Family. And um, I was sitting down with our owner, Will Gadera, and uh, Daniel Hume, who's our chef. And they're like, hey, the cocktails are great, but I don't give a shit, as I just said. Um, they're like, you need to make sure these cocktails come out to the tables. So I'm like, all right, well, what do I do? And then I started looking at the bar for sort of what it is. It's a hybrid somewhere between the dining room and the kitchen. So I looked to the kitchen to see how do they produce so many amazing plates and get it out in such a timely manner. So the first thing that we did, we looked at the kitchen and we looked at mise en place. So this is a picture of the bar, and this is a cheetah rail that we have, and these are all different syrups and infusions and spirits that we use within the cocktails. So mise en place is really important, because if you look, if you think about cooking, you're never going to make a taco, and after you make the taco, you're going to take hours to make a salsa or a hot sauce. You're going to need all of that stuff prepared before. And that's exactly what we do for executing cocktails. So while we do muddle some things, most of the things are infused beforehand for speed, efficiency, and consistency. 
So this is a, a picture of a bar, and basically, this is one station, and for us, it's important, just like a kitchen, that you don't need to move, that the, all your movements are just within one step to create this cocktail, because every extra step that you take is not efficient. We do all of our garnishes beforehand. Uh, this is something that surprises a lot of people, because everyone's like, you can't have fresh garnishes and cut them eight hours before. And that's not true, you can. You just need to know how to do it. So these are two examples of some of our garnishes that were done eight hours before. And I promise you, all of the cucumbers still were super fresh and, uh, and really held up. Um, wow, this is, sorry, this is all very messed up, but um, then the other thing that we did is we batch. We don't batch full cocktails ever. But to be efficient, we batch multiple ingredients that um, do not have a shelf life so we could have less steps. So to us, this is the same thing as in a kitchen making a stock. Like you're never going to start cooking down bones, adding salt, adding water. When you're going to make uh, a beef stock in a restaurant, you're going to do that all way beforehand. So this for us is our batch. Um, so there is a good, the bad, and the ugly batching. In the cocktail world, it's one of the worst terms ever. But it's not a bad thing. Uh, the thing that you need to look out for is consistency, having checks and balances, and there's a few things you need to look out for. Never batch anything that is perishable. Never batch any citrus. Uh, usually never batch any vermouth. Uh, never batch anything that's going to change in flavor. Um, we only batch multiple ingredients. So, for instance, in a zombie, we might have 15 different ingredients, and it would take you so much more time to pick up each bottle and jigger out 15 different bottles but a lot of those quarter ounce pours will batch into a two and a half ounce pour. So it's only a three bottle pickup. The other thing that we do, which we looked in the kitchen, is we have rules and steps for everything. So in a kitchen, you're gonna cook the fish the same exact way every time. You're gonna plate a dish the same exact way every time. And for us, we build a drink the same exact way every time. And by no means is this the only way to do this at all. This is what works for us. So it may not work for you, but we looked into our bar and we're like, what is most important for us? And for us, it's to create hospitality. It's for the drinks to be, uh, come out in an efficient and expedited process, uh, for the drinks to be consistent, and for the drinks to be timely. So the first thing that we do is we prepare our garnishes. So for us, we pull our garnishes first, because if you make a cocktail, you make this beautiful cocktail and then you reach down and you realize, oh fuck, I don't have any mint or I don't have any cucumber. This happens to us because we have such high volume. So for us to get more mint or cucumber, we have to run down two flights of stairs and into a walk-in, which takes about eight minutes. And as we already said, seven minutes or less, right? The next thing that we do is we build each cocktail, we retrieve the glassware, we dry shake, add ice or primers, well, whatever, you can see it here, but this is all really important, and if you see, all of these steps are also important because we want to provide hospitality. So for us, one of the most important things is when somebody walks in, we need to be able to step away at any moment to greet that person because at the end of the day, we're not serving cocktails, we're serving people. So pretty much all of these steps, at any given point, you could walk away unless you're shaking or stirring at that moment to greet somebody. And when you walk away, it's really important for you to be uh, consistent in this process so when you come back, you know exactly where you are. Or guess what? You walked away to greet somebody, I can step in your station. I can look down and know exactly where, are, where you are with your cocktails and finish creating your cocktails. Excuse me. Uh, the next thing that we looked for the kitchen in a collaborative way was through flavors. So these are... Um, a dish that's really famous, at the, uh, well, it's one of our dishes that's only dish that's been on the menu since the beginning, and it's um, the milk and honey, which is one of our desserts. And what it is, it's a dehydrated milk foam with buckwheat honey. Basically, think about cookies and cream as a kid when you used to drink cookies with milk. That's exactly what this dessert is. And through those flavors, it inspired a cocktail, which is this cocktail right here. Um, unfortunately, we're not serving for you today, but we do have a, delish, a delicious Absolute Elex cocktail in front of you. Um, and the Apprentice team has asked me to mention quite a few times 
for you to not take the pineapples with you. Elix does need them back, and they will be checking your bags on the way out, so don't make it awkward for anyone. Um, the other thing that we looked in the kitchen, what does the kitchen have that most bars don't have? They have amazing tools. And if all of this stuff exists, why not use them? But it's also really important for you to understand how to use these tools. Because I can't tell you how many bars you walk into and people don't know exactly what they're doing with these tools. But uh, it's another great part of collaborating with the kitchen. Uh, sorry, for the previous slide, I was talking about that cocktail. But what was really cool is that now, actually, in our collaborative process, um, the bartenders, or one bartender all the time, attends the chef's food development. And uh, we taste with the chef as they're developing their food. So for us, we taste all of their seasonal ingredients that they will be using. Uh, we taste all of their uh, ingredients that they're playing with, like fermented ingredients. Uh, and that inspires us. But what was really cool is for the first time last year, there was actually a cocktail that inspired a dish. So the collaboration works in both ways, which is pretty amazing. Um, I don't have much time, so I'm going to fly through the next few. But obviously, collaboration, these are more tools that you can use. Um, and then I want to talk about collaborating outside of your job. So we all have amazing bars in this room, I'm sure. Um, we all want to be one of the best bars in the world. We all want to create a consistent product. And something that's really important is to look outside of your community, the immediate bar community, and think about how can I make a better product with collaborating with like minds. So at the Nomad, we uh, actually have a, um, a gentleman, John O'Pandolfi, that makes all of this earthenware, this clayware. Um, and he had never really made any cups or bowls or anything food serviceable. But he was um, the roommate of one of our owners in college. And uh, he developed a line for us, which was Bespoke to Nomad. And it was a very collaborative way for us to do something more impactful, to do something from the community, to reach out to others. Um, as Karina mentioned as well earlier, we also collaborate in our own home with our staff. Uh, it's really important for us, for every single person on the staff, it doesn't matter who you are, to have a voice. Um, because without a voice, you don't feel ownership. So in all of our recipe testing, we invite all of our bartenders and barbacks, anyone on our staff and the bar team to come in and taste. And we use this not only as a way to create new cocktails, we use it as a way to mentor. And um, we also do something else called strategic planning, where every single person on the staff, it doesn't matter who you are, from dishwasher, porter, to manager, takes a day off, we close the restaurant, we sit down, and we all brainstorm for eight hours. And uh, we looked into other places like American Express, Google, Apple, and we're like, how do they do what they do? And this is one of the things that they do. They have everyone have a voice and give feedback. And some of our best ideas have come from this. Uh, some of our best ideas at 11 Madison Park uh, have come from this. Some of our best ideas at the Nomad. Um, you don't know who you're working with unless you really put a lot of effort into finding out what they have. And a lot of people have really amazing ideas. So take some time off, collaborate, and listen. That was, yeah, some, somebody got it, but it's fine. Uh, and then the next thing that I'm going to preach on about is collaborating with the community. So pretty much everyone in this room thinks that they're collaborative, that they work with others. But how many people here have ever shared a recipe? How many people here have ever learned a new technique and shown your bar that technique? How many people here have ever learned a new technique and gone to your friends next door and said, hey guys, why don't we hang out one day over cocktails and I could talk to you about this really cool shit that I learned at Tales of the Cocktail? A lot less people. We say we're collaborative. And you know, one of the worst ideas in this business to me is this idea of competition. And it's good and it's bad. It's good because if competition could be really healthy in that it pushes all of us to improve, to be better. But if a bar opens up next door, it's amazing. It's not competition. It brings more people in to come and drink. So we are still a new community. You guys are a new community here of cocktail lovers in Mexico, right? Everyone in Mexico does not drink cocktails. Everyone in America doesn't drink cocktails. How do you get more people to drink cocktails? Have more amazing bars serving great cocktails. How do you get more amazing bars serving great cocktails? You go out and you talk. You talk to people about all of the cool things that you learned, you share ideas, you share stories, and you collaborate. 
And um, for me, this has honestly been one of the secrets to our success because I never really had a mentor. If anything, I mean, this guy's been a mentor, this guy's been a mentor. I never had anyone teach me to do what I do. I picked up books, I read, I learned, I went online, and I made a lot of mistakes. Thankfully, nobody was looking. But one of the reasons that we were successful is because I always asked, how can I make this better or how can I do it differently? So I share all of my ideas, I share all of my recipes with whoever wants them. If any of you ever want a recipe, email me, I'll be happy to give it. Or we do have a book, the Nomad Cocktail Book and Cookbook. It's available on Amazon.com. Here's a little plug. Um, sorry, that was really cheesy. but No, but honestly, be open, share, share ideas, share stories, start a conversation. Because we, without that, we can't grow as a community. Without having people drinking more cocktails, we will never grow. Um, well, I mean, pretty much that's all I have to say except thank you, and please do not take your pineapples home. <laughs> Absolutely, Elixir is the back. Now I know how to say it. Please don't take the pineapples. <laughs> thank you.